dear God, that we would know how to pray against and that we can bring brothers and sisters together. And we pray against the enemy that would come against the body of Christ. Lord, we pray that you would open doors and that you would close doors, Lord, according to your will. Let our vision be clear to follow after you. Touch everything that we do in the remainder of this service in your precious name. Amen. 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 I didn't look at the worship list this week, this week, but it goes along with everything uh, that we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, public service announcement, and uh, Micah, I apologize. I missed it. Uh, the new website or the updated website is available now. And next week during the announcements, if you'll do a walkthrough on the screen, uh, we have some new folks in the sound booth. Thank you, ladies, for stepping up uh, so we can have words on the screen and, and music and all those things. Uh, these gentlemen have been doing it for three years and needed a break, and we appreciate them. But if you go to www.harvestcog.net, harvestcog.net, you can see all the updates if you know how to walk through a website, and uh, every Tuesday morning the sermon goes live there. Uh, we're not doing, because we're not doing first service now, so we are not doing Facebook Live at this time. So you will need to, if you see somebody that needs the sermon, uh, or you want to watch it again, or, or just laugh at the preacher, whatever it is, uh, Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m., the web, uh, the sermon goes live on our Harvest page and YouTube page. If you don't know how to get to that, ask Mike to sign you up, and it will send you a bleep on your phone that tells you it's available. Uh, before we get into the sermon, I was praying, and the Lord spoke this to me. He said, sometimes you have to push. Sometimes you have to push. For those of you doing Biggest Loser, you know that sometimes it's not about sitting on the couch, eating whatever you want, and expecting God to make the weight fall off. For those of you that are sick of being poverty stricken all your life, you know that there's a plan you have to put in place. You know that if you truly want God to move in your finances, you're going to have to do your part. You're going to have to push. Amen. And you know that in anything in this life, if you want it bad enough and you're willing to push for it, you can make it come to pass. Now you say, are you saying that we're little gods? Nope. I'm just saying that God helps us help ourselves sometimes. I said that to say this, and I believe the Lord spoke this, and we'll get into the sermon. Some of us in this room today want to worship God with all of our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our spirit, but we just get to the point where it gets difficult, and we stop. And sometimes to get into the presence of God, you're going to have to block everything else out of your mind, and that's a physical part for you. Sometimes you're going to have to get beyond the junk that went on this week. Sometimes if you're going to step into the presence of God, you're going to have to make an effort and literally move beyond. It's going to be tough because you're going to have to make a move. As a pastor, I trust me, when I'm trying to worship and I'm trying to get into it, I'm wondering what's going haywire, what's not messed up, who's sick, why are this one not here, why? The, the reality is you've got to get beyond that to get into the presence of God. If you understand that, give him praise in the house. Popular scripture today, and 
I believe God wants to touch you. Message title is The Promise. The Promise. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. You guys are too quiet this morning. You're in the spit zone. You know that, right? Give him praise in the house. You're going to shout for those goofy 49ers or those Chiefs this evening. Let's give praise to the one that created it all. Give him praise one more time. See, I am the world's worst. 
We're building a Camaro for Micah, and everything in it has got to be customized underneath. And it's like, okay, we got the transmission, we got this, we got this. Okay, that doesn't work. Well, we'll fix that. Okay, well, that doesn't work. Well, we'll fix this. Okay, well, that doesn't work. We'll fix And then yesterday, I'm like, ah! I still have a transmission laying on the ground. That should not be seven days later. Moving on. Did you move it? No, it's on the ground. We actually laid it on the ground. In your garage. And he says, run the race. What is your race? What is your particular race? Let me move on. We'll get back to that. Then it says these words. I hadn't caught it like this before. But it says, looking unto Jesus. Now, he just told us that we need an example, right? And then he tells us the example. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, this one was a boom for me. It won't be for you, I'm sure, but it was for me. The author. You know what that means? He's the one that wrote the plan that put him on the cross in the first place. He's the one that wrote the plan that put him on the cross in the first place. He's the author of it. It wasn't like God said, I'm going to change plans. The Old Testament didn't work. In the beginning, in the beginning, he wrote a plan. He was the author of it. And John 1 tells us that he is the word. And that he literally is the word. Logos, the written word, if you will. And he says that he is the word. He is the author. Can I say this to you today? If you are a born-again child of God, it is because God wrote it and said so. You had to choose, you had to accept, but it literally says that he is the author. And I'm looking at this thinking, you wrote your own death story. That'd be like one of those people that love to smoke cigarettes till they die from it, right? Mad one. Or the one that would drink the alcohol until their liver rotted out, right? And then, oh God! No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> smile, come on. Dreams. Ha. The one that ate so much fried chicken. Let's get on that one, too. 450-pound preacher smoking, preaching about smoking, and I'm thinking, dude, back away from the buffet. You going to die from a heart attack? Stop it. Or diabetics eating cake, right? Can I get a witness over there? Free of cake. Glory. Ha. The author and finisher. He is our example. He's the one that overcame all temptation. He's the example. And then this is one of those things that, that you don't catch if you don't dig in it and you don't study. It says, for the joy set before him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him. What could be joyous about the hell that he's about to go through? What could be joyous? If I'm going to look at this from a different angle, I probably need to understand what the joy is, you see? In the Greek, the word joy is chara. C-H-A-R-A in our language, chara, if you will, in the Greek. And here's what it says. The word joy literally means that it comes from you. Not from Christ, but from you. His joy is you. You are his joy. Joy. Now get this, and you can look it up in the Strong's Concordance. It says, the joy comes from you, or of persons who are one's joy. Don't miss this. He said the example is that he is the author and finisher of it, and that for the joy for you, for me, now I know that, but I never saw it like this. When he knew what was coming, when he knew the struggle to get to the end of this thing, the only thing he saw was you, Jim Nelson. The only thing he saw was Mark Woody. The only thing he saw was Kurt Holder. And he said, you know what? That they make me so happy that I am worth, that I will give everything I have for him. I will give everything for them. Because when it says joy, it literally means every single man, woman, and child in this room. For the reason that he said, I'm willing to not only be the author of it, but I'll finish it because of you. 
because of you. I will finish it because of you. And then he says that if I want an example of how to live my Christian walk, look at Christ. Looking unto the author and finisher of it. He wrote the plan. It began in Exodus chapter 12. Or it began before that. But in Exodus chapter 12. It literally paints the picture of a Passover lamb. Who He is our Passover lamb. It literally shows us from the beginning. Exactly what must take place. And he's been the lamb since the beginning of time. And he literally says I do this. Because you. Are my joy. When it gets tough. I'm going to finish it. What is your plan? What is your vision for the future? What is your vision spiritually for your life? For those of us that like to eat, come on, I've ate with you this week, Tom. I did good, didn't I? Very. Can I say this to you? Yeah, I didn't eat at all. That's right. I watched y'all eat. Can I say this? Can I pat myself for a little bit here? Six days from now, I celebrate seven years of being your pastor. I actually preached my first sermon February 10th, 2013, after trying out as your pastor. For the first time in seven years, I checked my blood sugar this morning and it's normal. Amen. see me before I was formed in my mother's womb. It was joyful enough for him when he saw me before I was formed in my mother's womb. He saw me and he said, I'll go to the cross for that guy. I'll suffer for everything that he does and every mistake that he makes. I'm willing to nail it to the cross of Calvary because I love him. He is my joy. Can I say this to you? If we do not have a vision and a plan for the future, we will never have the promise that God has for us. Come on. What was the plan? It says for us to have faith. He's the author and finisher of our faith. To finish the race. For the joy me to reevaluate my 25 years of study. Well, that's a task if you're studying 30 hours a week, Sterling. It's a task to reevaluate it all. It'd be like asking one of coaches swimmers to change the way they swim their whole life, but he wants them to improve, so that's what they need to do. He wants them to be better. So he wants me to quit this habit or that habit or that one or that one. And all he did for me was to write a plan where he could come to earth from heaven, come to earth, stay for 33 years, and then die on the cross of Calvary, being humiliated, being abused, being beaten, being whipped, being cut, being striped. And he did all that four or 2,000 years ago because of me. And all he's asking me to do is reevaluate the way I study. Dude, I got this. Never asked me to be nailed to anything. If my cross means I have to reevaluate the way I say things, whoo! His yoke is easy, right? His, my burdens are light. Because he planned, his vision was to see me saved. His vision was to see you saved. His vision for you, his joy, was willing to. Make a plan to suffer the most horrific death that the world has ever known for you. And he 
He's asking you to give up a little something. He's asking you to study a little longer. Open the Bible before Facebook. And move on. Seems like a pretty good trade-off to me. Seems like a real good trade-off to me. He endured the cross. He worked the plan. If you don't have a plan, first of all, you're not going to grow in the Lord. If you don't work the plan, you're pretty much going to stay right where you're at. Amen. He worked the plan. He endured. The scripture says he endured. The, he suffered, but he finished it. It says he was despising the shame. Picture the plan set in stone in the Old Testament. Consider that he endured. Notice what he said. Catch this. The first part says, look to Jesus as your example. And then he says, because he wants us to remember it, consider. So not only once does he say look, but then he turns around and says, consider. In other words, don't forget this. Here I am trying to figure out who a crowd of witnesses are, and I'm missing the whole point of the thing is that he is the author of the whole thing and the finisher of it all. If I never know who the crowd of witnesses are, glory! But if I win this race, I told you when we began, I don't like patience. But what if God said to you, you say to God, I want someone in my life. I want to be out of debt. I want to be this. I want to be that. And he says, wait. Is that really so hard in the big scheme of things? Is it really so hard? Did he say, wait on a cross and hang there with your hands? And All he said was, wait. All he said was, I'm going to give you a plan. If you listen to me, you write down the plan, you make it plain, and then you move forward with it. And I'm thinking, the entire Bible comes down to a man dying on a cross, and he counted it joy, he counted it me. He says he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Now, in the literal term, in the literal, I understand that. And in the, in the, maybe in the uh, metaphorical, however you want to say it, I understand that, that we're all sinners, right? And that we were all sinners once and that we were sinners and that he did that. But in the physical realm, the people that he was trying to save came against him. They fought him tooth and nail. So he literally endured the sinners that were right in front of him. And for the joy of them to know him, he was willing to let them nail him to a cross. And he's asked me to wait or asked me to give up fried chicken. Can I tell you, grilled chicken ain't so bad. Fighting against us and our sin. You're going to have to wait a few months or a few years. You mean I don't have to go to a cross? You mean to be filled with the Holy Ghost I have to give up control of my own life? Lord, I just can't do that. And he goes, really? Let me bring you the example. Look unto Jesus as the example. He said, I gave up heaven. I gave it all up. <coughs> he tells us this twice. This song came to my mind when I was working on my notes. Mind blown, JC. It says, You came from heaven to earth to show. show me the plan that you wrote about in Hebrews 12. Amen. I'm supposed to look to you for the plan. <coughs> and the plan is to win, to get rid of sin in my life. The plan is to finish the race. And I'm thinking, that song, I've 
sung it my whole life, just about, or at least my whole Christian life, not necessarily back in the other. The only song that you sing when you're drunk and out in the world is Amazing Grace. That's the only Christian song anybody ever sings is Amazing Grace. Because let's be honest, it's the only one we know. sometimes to get where God's taking you. There's a promise at the end of it. There's a promise at the end of it. Can you picture him speaking to his disciples? Okay, dude, check this out. Here's the plan now. I, you know I'm the son of God, right? So here's the plan. I've got to die so that you can have life eternal. 
I've got to die. Now check this out. He's telling them the plan and they're rebuking him. <coughs> How many times do I rebuke him when he says, can you do something simple? set before him in the plan, the vision, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He won the promise. You know what I'd like to get out of reevaluating things this year? To shut my complaining mouth. Because I complain a lot about things going wrong in Haywire. Tom, there ain't nothing wrong with haywire in my life. You say, well, what about, what about, what about, what about? I don't have no cross. I don't have no nails. I don't have no scars. I don't have no stripes. All I got is a Savior. <laughs> I win! The game's not over yet. Don't matter. I win! All I got to do is finish. But I want to finish strong. I want to finish strong because he had a plan for 6,000 years, 4,000 before it came into play. And he said, there is a promise at the end of this, and it's for those that will accept me. I have a promise that when they accept me and they follow me, that they will overcome this world, and I will get to be with them in all eternity. And he says, it's worth anything I go through to get the promise. And I'm thinking, God. If you can do that for me, I can preach to a full house or an empty house. I can come a little early or leave a little late. I can show up on time. I can do whatever I need to do, God. <coughs> and he said you can't do anything if you don't have a plan. Yesterday morning we had a plan. Gym at 7, back home, put on work clothes and be under the Camaro before 8. About right, wasn't it? Before the fire was started. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing works right with the transmission. Nothing. <laughs> but can I tell you what did work? The rest of the plan. The oil got changed. The rear end got fixed. The, uh, the wiring got fixed. The uh, windshield area got cleaned for the new windshield to go in. The doors got about 95%. What would have happened had we not had a plan? Transmission won't work or going home. Nothing would have got accomplished. But because I can't get to this part of the plan yet, you skip down and you move on. If you don't have a plan to grow spiritually, you won't accomplish the promise at the end of that growth cycle. There has to be a plan in place. How do I know that? Because he gave me an example. What is your plan? What will you do with the race that God has set before you? Let me just throw this out there, and I'm about to close. If you don't have a plan, you plan to fail. Period. There are two teams that will play today that have fought all year long. The one that executes the plan better will win. You might have a favorite, but the one that executes the plan better will win. If you don't plan, you plan to fail. If you don't work the plan, the plan will fail. If you have a plan and work the plan, the author and finisher's plan will bring the promise to your life.
talk to hurting people. Every day. Every day. And do you know about 70% of those or more, probably 7 out of 10, are going through the same thing they've been going through over and 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 over because they refuse to put a plan in place <coughs> and to get past it. <coughs> they live right here hoping God's going to drop a miracle in their lap when he says, hey, go dip in the river seven times. That's the plan. You want your miracle? Go dip in the river seven times. Do you know what he said to the man at the pool of Bethesda? Do you even want to be healed? Do you even want to be healed? If I'm Jesus, I'm thinking, the whole pool's full of people. This guy's been there, what, 38 years? And Jesus walks up to one cat, one guy. Do you even want to be healed? Well, I got, no, 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 I got, I got. you got excuses. Amen. Because here's the way I see it. If I'm 38 years waiting to get in the pool, try to stop me. Because I'm going to break your legs. I'm going to whittle a stick if nothing else and stab you. I'm getting in the pool. I'm from the South. I'm going to stick. But if I'm laying up on the third step knowing I can't walk, waiting for that moment in time when Jesus shows up and just fixes it for me, I may be laying for the next 38 years. Or I can put a plan into place. And I can say, God, this is what you want for my life. This is where the next step is to be. This is what you want me to do. I know you want me to grow in you, so here's where I'm going. If you want to change it, you show me. But God, I'm going to do something to move forward. Well, I'm waiting to hear the Lord. Really? Here's what he said to you waiting. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Baptizing them that believe. And these signs of all them that believe. In my name they will cast out devils. Well, I don't know who the Lord wants me to lay hand on. You see some devil-possessed people? Go to the mall and start laying hands on somebody. Until you hear his voice, tell somebody about Jesus. Here's what I know. God has made me a lot of promises. One that he reminded me of this week was... I believe God's people are on the verge of the miracle promises of God and yet have refused to take the step forward to make it happen. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Getting on your knees. Doing whatever it takes to make a difference. Do something for God. Make a plan and work a plan. Do something. Jason, took me two years side to side. They're working a plan. Titles on the way, no paper. The way I wanted it to happen. Because I work the plan. Not as nice as yours, but it's cool. <laughs> I'm going to show up at your house too, just to harass you too. <laughs> He's got one too. You know what? Here's the truth. I could have went and bought it months ago if I'd have wanted to borrow the money to do that. Here's what Christ said. I'm the example. He said it twice. In two verses, he said it twice. Look at the example. And then he said, here's the plan. Work it. I'm going to close one more thing. I'm going to shut up, I promise. How many landings is this? Three? Mike is over shaking his head. 
last seven years, you've probably heard this story seven or eight times. I'm going to tell it one more time. I spent about four years drunk with a man named Willie Parker. Literally drunk for four years. Got my heart right with God. Didn't go see Willie much anymore. Driving from Cleveland, Tennessee to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hickory Valley Apartments. God said, stop by and tell Willie I love him. <clears throat> no, God, I can't do that. He said, stop and tell him I love him. He needs to hear it. God, there's too much history. I can't do that. <clears throat> but I'll tell you what I'll do. Thursday, I'm going back to Cleveland. I'll stop and tell him then. Two days too late. Four years old, Willie Parker walked out on his back porch with a massive heart attack in his car. If I had just worked and put in. And according to the way I understand the Old Testament, the works and the New Testament, I'm not judged on my sin if I'm forgiven. But the works. I'll have to stand before God and give an account of it. And one of those plans he asked me to do was to tell Willie he loved him. And I got to answer God, the one that made a plan to save me, the one that said, I'm his joy, he should have struck me dead a long time ago. to grow beyond where they're at. 